I'm talking about growing your business. I'm not talking about growing it from the top line. I'm talking about growing it from within. How do you get it so, uh, such a well-oiled machine that it's just producing money nonstop and get that stress out of your life? From Sarah Systems and Billy Go, this is No BS with Billy Stevens and Landon Brewer, the unfiltered, straight-shooting podcast that dives deep into the heart of home service trades to uncover the truth about running your business. You're entering the No BS Zone with Billy and Landon. Uh, welcome back. We are so excited to uh, have you join us today. Today we have something um, you've probably never heard any podcast talk about before. Your junk drawer. Now, what's a junk drawer to you, Landon? Junk drawer. I mean, first of all, can we just acknowledge something for a second? I'm not sure you're the real Billy Stevens. <laughs> you look uh, 20 years younger than him. At, at, like the Billy that I know. You uh, you're like there's something different about you. I can't figure out what it is. Well, I shaved. You're missing facial hair. I'm missing That's facial weird. hair. That's right. I've got all this baby skin underneath all that beard I've had for all these years. Well, you have an operation. <laughs> I like, probably need one. Did the last topic that we talked about, how you had to shave to be uh, presentable, that was the old school Tom Hopkins stuff. Did that get to you? Man, I couldn't sleep at night. I'm like, I got to shave so I can so I can be more presentable and more respectable. No, that's not what it is. You really want to know why I shaved? Do I have to tell yes, everyone please. here in the wide world of listening? <laughs> the real reason is, and my wife says that I, um, yeah, she says I puff too much when I sleep and the the, uh, the tape that she wanted to put around on my mouth wouldn't stick with my uh, beard and mustache. So I shaved it all off so I could put this tape on. And it's a funny story because I put the tape on and she's so excited that I'm going to be quiet so she can get all of her sleep and everything, you know, and what really prompted this is, you know, the several nights that I've woken up and there's a pillow over my face and for some reason she's sitting on the pillow. <laughs> so I'm like, maybe I should shave here <laughs> if I want to survive. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, so that is why I shaved, and I'll be uh, honest with you, sir. We put the tape uh, in the middle of the in the middle of my mouth, and I um, I uh, what do you want to call it? I uh, was puffing from the sides that we didn't cover up, so it didn't really work anyway. So I'm pretty daggum tired after doing all this work every day. You know, when I go to sleep, I just fall right to sleep, and you know, I can't be in charge of what happens after that. And frankly, I don't think she knows what she's talking about because I've never heard myself do it. Well, I just made a a list right now as as you're you're saying you know, you know what are the top three thing, things that because uh, I'm I'm a big believer as you know in masks uh, I'm sure you you see my <laughs> my post about that what are the top three things that masks and beards have in common one they they make you look like an entirely different person. When you have one on your face, you, you almost can't tell who that person is, right? I, yeah. I didn't recognize you. Number two, they they attract and retain germs, right? So you get, you know, particles and stuff stuck in your beard just like you would in, in the mask, right? They make you sick. And number three, especially in your case, they hide a lot of ugly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's all right. I can live with it. <laughs> uh, do we have a topic or what well yeah let's get back to our junk drawer uh that we were going to talk about today so what is a junk drawer so we all know in your house we all have a drawer somewhere in the house if not several that we just put stuff in it could be anything from batteries rubber bands paper clips uh heck mask from the past and whatever, you know, these drawers are just uh, put anything in there kind of place. And then when you're looking for something, you never actually go back to the junk drawer to try to find it. Um, because by then you've actually started a second one or whatever. And so this is a common occurrence for us at home. Do you think it happens in our businesses as well? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It happens. Like, 
Yeah, so probably the, there's probably a correlation that uh, you can't quantify, but the, the more junk drawers and the more stuff that you have in, into a business, probably the less profitable, systematic, et cetera, that it is, right? Yeah, so, you know, every company has a junk drawer. I mean, Billy Go has one. We all, there's a junk drawer in every company. And I think where we make a lot of mistakes is, is we give everyone in the company a, a junk drawer <laughs> instead of just having one. And what I mean by that, let's just let's, let's just figure this out together. So, for instance, let's just take a CSR. So for the, for everybody out there, a customer service rep, someone that answers the phone. Their job duty is to answer the phone and probably do outbounding. That's the job duty of my CSR. So, I mean, that's really why we hire them. Answer the phones, do anything phone-related with the customer, um, do outbounding and when there's no calls coming in. Um and, and to me, that's pretty much what I hire them to do. But what we do as, a, as business owners is maybe we get a really good CSR that, or, and, and they want extra work. You're like, hey, you know, it's kind of slow. I need some extra work, you know. And you're like, well, I'll do some more outbounding or whatever. Nobody likes outbounding, but, you know, it's a very critical part of the business. And what happens is we go, you know what? Susie over there said that she needs a little help with keeping up with these permits. We've been getting a lot of permits later or, or lately. And maybe uh, Jim Bob over there needs some help with this. And then we need you to do this as well when you have time. Maybe we need you to make sure everybody's clocked in or whatever it is. And you just start handing them all these extra jobs. And now we're getting less performance from the actual job that we intended for them. But it doesn't stop there because then we do that to the dispatcher and we do that to the office managers. We do that to the department managers. We do that to technicians, people in the field, whoever. We give them jobs that don't really fit their job descriptions because there's so many things to do. And here's a perfect example of just one item. Let's say, for instance, you have a technician that breaks his cell phone. He needs that cell phone to operate. What do you do? Who's in charge? Who's handling that? How many people are handling that cell phone thing? Just that one thing. This guy broke his cell phone. What do we do? Well, that to me is a job that should be in the junk drawer or managed by someone that handles the junk drawer. It shouldn't be handled by the apartment manager. It shouldn't be handled by the office manager. It shouldn't be handled by CSR. This is what we're talking about today is how do we keep people focused on their real jobs and get all these other little things that just keep us from doing our jobs. And so we fill up the drawers with all kinds of stuff. And a perfect example is how many different things do you have each employee doing that's not job related? How many employees do you have checking off, um, you know, working on permits? How many people do that? How many people help the technicians out in the field and they're working office and they're not even directly related to what the techs do, but they're just helping out the department manager in a tech related situation. How much time do we spend figuring out how many spiffs or bonuses or percentages that we owe these technicians every week? Um, isn't that a payroll thing? Why are, why are department managers doing this job? They, that, that's their junk drawers full. Inner office email, the worst offender of all, of junk of junk drawer, you know, filling up. Um, maybe you're getting, you know, 50 to 100 inner office emails daily. How many of those actually pertain to you? Yeah, well, I mean, what's worse? So, so you see all of these extra tasks being added to, to these employees, team members, uh, owners, whoever. Uh and at some point, it seems like, you know, now you start hiring people to do just those tasks on top of it, right? So in, in your cell phone example, like, do you have an IT manager that that uh, manages all of the IT assets of Billy Go? Of course not. We have, everyone does IT, don't they? We have one main person that knows more than everyone else, but everybody's involved in it because they all run right, to this. Companies that are your size companies that have IT managers, right? <laughs> it's like you have an IT manager. Well, well, you know, we probably need an IT manager. That's a whole junk drawer to itself, right? That's what I'm saying. So, so what's like, how do you handle that stuff? Like, what's the, 
you know, because I get where you're going with this and I see it nonstop in businesses. It's like uh, I got one specific example that, that springs to mind. A few years back, we acquired a, a plumbing business and a uh, fantastic plumbing business. I think it was like, a, you know, 12, 13 million dollar plumbing business at the time. Just a, a amazing location. I mean, this place, it had friggin batting cages in it. It had, uh, you know, they, they were a Nexstar company, uh, so they took all of the, the those important pieces about Nexstar culture uh, into it, right? They had, you know, like I said, the batting cages. They had uh, just this 30,000 square foot beautiful facility with all kinds of cultural games and this spin the wheel and just uh, parties and this. And it was, you know, pretty magnificent looking thing. And then, you know, we, we go, we get a couple months in and, you know, kind of uh, doing well, doing well. And all of a sudden, you know, there's a little shakeup in personnel and the people are going this and it's and now profits kind of going down instead of going up. So I go and, and live there effectively for, you know, a couple months. And as I'm just sitting there the first few days watching what everybody does and, and, and they just have a ton of employees, uh, I'm just kind of watching and watching and watching massive inefficiency. And, and so then I just say, Hey, you know, everybody like, you know, give me everybody's job description. Give me everybody's job functions. Is there a daily task or daily schedule that you keep? And nobody kept a daily schedule. Nobody had a daily list of tasks that they had to check off. No, like nobody. It was just like, okay, uh, ops manager, you're in charge of this group of people and, and, uh, you got to make sure they get paid on time and they're performing and they're doing this. And it's like, you're just, you oversee this, this group of people and you oversee this group of people. And it was very chaotic every day. And so I, I just kind of watched and just, you know, documented what everybody spent their time doing. And it was a hundred percent, like not hundred percent, it was like 80% of it was inefficient stuff. It was, you're supposed to be in a meeting right now where you're not holding the meeting. Well, I had to have this guy hold a meeting because the this guy's got payroll issues and this guy over here wants to quit and this guy's got a customer issue and I had to put out all these fires. It's like fire and fire and fire. And it that's just mass inefficiency causing to the, you know, excess number of employees, which creates more inefficiency and just terrible hit the profit. And so I just went around and I sat with everybody and I said, hey, you know, here's a basic template that I have for each of these job descriptions, which is a, a ta daily task schedule. And I want you to, you know, we don't have to live by this. Like, here's your job function, your job description. I want you to make a daily task schedule Monday through Friday. Like every 30 minutes, I come in at 7 a.m. and I make the board, make sure that the board is set for the day. Make sure that I've got uh, the right roster. Make sure, that, you know, I got my first meeting at 730 and, you know, whatever that might be. Like, let's just go down the list and make sure you have an efficient way to manage your time every day. And so everybody did that. They turned it in. We agreed. Great. And so the first couple of days went smooth and, and, and it was rolling. And then I uh, go back to check in a week from that day. And I'm like, OK, well, you're supposed to be here right now. You're not doing that. Well, this guy had this and this got pushed back over here and this and, and chaos. Right. Go to the next guy. Same thing. And this guy's out in the field instead of doing what what this this person was supposed to be doing. This lady's over here doing this. It's like nobody kept to the task schedule, and it was because they had all this extra junk from the junk drawer of these tasks. And it's just like it's insane levels of inefficiency. And so battling that in a large company is is a tough thing to do. That's a big shift to move um, when you have that much inefficiency. So my question was, what was the average batting? average um were they hitting the ball in the cage or did they start hitting the ball outside of the cage it, it was uh like i don't even know I, I so they had acquired this building from like an optometrist that had it <laughs> in the in the building and, and it was i mean it was cool it was very expensive per square foot to keep uh, but you know and then we had parking issues didn't have enough parking but we had the batting cage uh so <laughs> Just one of those things, right? What a junk drawer that is. Yeah, it's like, you know, back on the IT part of it, I mean, that's the biggest junk drawer of all. I mean, the IT person is usually in charge of HR too. Have you ever noticed that? Yep. <laughs> and and then if you have someone in charge of HR and they're in charge of IT, then they're naturally in charge of maybe uh, 
some other big part of the business, uh, whether it's the uh, the office management or apartment manager of some sort, it's it's always given to uh, you know that the the most of the go getters, and so we bog the go getters down, and then nobody's go getting anymore, and that's the problem with the drunk drawer. And why we're having this topic today is. <clears throat> It's just a constant inefficiencies that happen because we just don't have a plan and and knowing what we should do. I mean, it's like when you start a business, you're the manager of the business, you're the owner of the business in the very beginning. You do you wear all the hats. That's that's has to happen. But at some point you have to start passing those duties along. And unfortunately, what we do is, you know, you brought up that uh, one uh, best practice group there. And a lot of what they do is they like to throw people at problems, which is just basically opening up another drawer to put junk in. And putting, throwing people at problems is not the answer because the, all the problems are still there. You just added more people to it. And in a per- perfect scenario of why this is an issue, when you have a job that's not getting done, <clears throat> or a task that's not getting done and you try to give it to someone else, they'll take it, but they've already have way too many jobs that you've given them in the past, but you can depend on them to somewhat manage it or monitor it, not necessarily do it because they're already overloaded. And then you bring up the fact that, you know what, I have an idea. Why don't I just hire someone to do this and you won't have to do it? And what's the normal reaction from that? You get more of a negative reaction from that response. Here you are, you're thinking in your head, I'm going to help you by bringing in another person to take away some of this junk in the drawer. And then the person that's dealing with all the junk in the drawer is like, well, who's going to train this person? Well, you are. Well, then you just added more junk for me to do. It's just easier if I just go ahead and do it, you know, and even though I'm not doing it fully, um, it's better than training someone else again to do it. And, and that is the scenario that we get ourselves in. And this is where inefficiency comes from. And, you know, we, you and I talk a lot about efficiency. We spend hours and hours and I don't even know how many hundreds of hours on this topic and efficiencies going around here all the time um, throughout the industry now starting to be talked about more and more, but no one ever actually says, what is it? They just talk about it. And, and it's, this is a perfect scenario of efficiency. And it's just one thing that we're talking about today is it, it's just this drawer full of all the stuff that you make us do that. Do we, do we really even need to be doing it at all? That's one thing we need to figure out. And then do we need to be giving so much of this stuff to, so many different people. And so when you have department managers figuring out spiffs and making sure the guy's times are right and doing all this stuff, is that their job? Would that be the ultimate job? Is that what you signed up for? It's not. You signed, you got that position because you've shown that you can do something really good in the field and people kind of migrated towards you. So that means you're a leader personality. And the job started off where I'm going to give you this job promotion. Yeah, it doesn't pay as much as being out in the field. It's management. You know, we all say that same story. Or we've said it in the past. Um, But, you know, since you're good at it in the field, you must be good at it as a manager. Everybody's asking you how to do it. And so we're just going to start handing off all these jobs to you. And then the next thing you know, they're not doing what you actually brought them in to do anymore. And it just keeps compounding from there and it keeps compounding throughout the company from there. And that, I mean, if you're not careful, you turn every management position in your company to, you know, initially the idea is to manage people to perform, to manage revenue and profit generating activities. And typically what happens without, because you don't have like the right systems and structures and they don't have the right skill sets maybe is, you end up managing chores. You do chores instead of revenue and profit generating activities, which is ideally the function you should be doing. So my definition of efficiency is what percentage of time for every position in the business, whether it's your CSR example, dispatcher example, manager example, call by call, install, technician, et cetera. What percentage of your time is spent doing revenue generating, profit creating activities versus busy work and chores? Yep. Get rid of the busy work and chores. 
find yeah. someone to do them, focus on them in the right department, you know, wherever they may be. If you're a small shop, you got to find someone to do those things, but that doesn't interfere with the, the money, the operation of day to day. Yep. Separate the two. And the problem is, is we intermingle them and now we're suffering on both sides. Nothing's getting done in the junk drawer and nothing's getting done as well as it could be getting done on the operation side or the revenue side. And so if there's any advice we can give to people out there now is just take a look at how you've done this in your business. And I didn't say, I'll be very clear here. I didn't say how you might've done this in your business. It's how you've done this in your business because we all do it. And it has to be become, and it has to become something that you're really thinking about before you going forward, you need to think about, am I just causing more junk to get in the way of success? And, and, and it's a, you know, just like I was talking about earlier about the cell phones, just, you know, one guy losing one cell phone or breaking the cell phone. That stops a lot of people for a couple of hours in that one day. It stops the way, the way we do it now. A lot of people do it now or almost everyone does it now. It stops a lot of people from getting their regular job done because we involve a lot of people because who's that tech going to go to when he's never been told who to go to when his phone breaks, he's going to go to whoever handed it to him possibly, yeah. or he's going to go to his, his, his superior who he deals with every day, which is most likely because whoever handed it to him, may have been his superior because he was in charge of onboarding of his own technicians when he shouldn't be in onboarding anyone. Um, and so no one really knows who to go to. It's really the problem, right? Yes. Yeah, my gas card's not working. Uh, something's wrong with my time sheet. It's, uh, you know, I got to get the uh, oil change in the vehicle. It's, you know, there's a myriad of things that, that come up nonstop and, you know, whether you have one person that's your chief of staff or whatever you call them that uh, is re is allocated specifically to handling all of that stuff, including, you know, IT and the rest and HR, uh, whether you have one person that's specifically designated for that or whether somebody has to handle those things. It's like, okay, uh, if you have to, if you're charged with handling that stuff as a manager, create that daily task list, right? And, you know, 30 minutes of, of time blocks, maybe twice a day, designate to those things at maybe 930 after everybody's out, they're in the middle of their first calls. Now I can handle whatever fire might be required of me to handle. Right. So just schedule those things in. What happens is they're the, like, you can manage those things more efficiently, but you know, typically when a fire erupts of some sort, everybody rushes to put it out. The manager rushes to put it out. And so, you know, something's wrong with my pay or this kind of person has got to complete. Like, okay. Well, uh, I have, uh, 9.30 to 9.50, a scheduled block of time to deal with this. Uh, your issue is important to me. I know it's important to you. Can we deal with it at 9.30? That's all you got to say instead of saying, okay, you go do my meeting and, and handle the technicians while I deal with this. Right? That's I mean, there's just always a more efficient way of doing it. Absolutely. Just controlling your day, making time for the, uh, for the outliers. Yep. Instead of mingling the outliers into your day and dealing with your hair on fire. I mean... We have to get out of the hair on fire business philosophy in this industry. We have to put in efficient processes. We need to know who to report to and who and what, how to handle things. And not only that, if, if, if a technician brings it to his department manager, does he know what to do with it? Does he know who to go to? Usually, you know, who they usually gravitate to, um, depending on the size of the company. Obviously, if it's a smaller company, they go typically to the, the wife of the ownership right? As the business gets bigger, they go to accounting for some reason for almost everything. <laughs> yeah, they go to whoever's that uh, employee exactly. friendly, you know, yeah. whoever. Yeah. Yeah. And what does accounting know about getting new phones? <laughs> <laughs> what does accounting know about talking to, to, to the tech about anything? You know, they're, they're too busy yeah. accounting. <laughs> It's amazing. It's amazing. And, and so it's just the little things is really all it comes down to when it comes to running these companies. And instead, 
we buy all these uh, these shiny objects that are supposed to solve these problems when really we could just solve it with a little bit of thinking um, through through the process because you, you know you got to buy phones. You know you got to hand out phones. You know you got to take care of the phones that get damaged and replace phones and upgrade phones and all these things. Um, you know, I was in a, in a, in a meeting talking about upgrades, you know, like for instance, when you do an update in one of these shiny objects, you, you do an upgrade and way this company handled it, it was a bigger outfit. And he said that they would bring them into the office and have their, they'll do all the upgrading stuff on their meeting day. So that means they would literally run without the updated stuff until that next meeting day came along, which is probably not good because now you're having issues, but he, he said that they would make them stay in there until they could verify and that they verify from each individual that they did the upgrade and actually walk to that individual and see that it was done and then go to the next person and see what it had done. And this is like a 50, 60 tech company. And my question was, is why? It's always Why? Um, why do you do it like that? He goes, well, we can't tell if they did it or not. And I'm like, okay. So we involved the entire office staff, management staff, all these people to make sure everyone's on the same update. And he was like, yeah. And I said, okay. Why can't you just see if they updated or not? on the carrier or in your software or whatever, you know, in this say in this situation, in their software, the software needed to be upgraded and you couldn't even tell, you know, they're not using technology to help them get rid of the junk drawer. Right. So we so what are the man hours? We have 50 guys in there. Can't run a call yet. The meeting started at seven 30. We're still going through one by one by one at nine 30. Nothing's getting done. The, the dispatcher's freaking out. We got these calls to run. They're freaking out. They're yelling, you know, getting a hold of whoever. And then it's just one bad day for, for the entire day for everyone in the company that had nothing to do with doing a simple upgrade on a cell phone or on the software in the company. Terrible, terrible inefficiencies. And that's what we're talking about. That's the junk drawer that we're talking about is how, how we just, we got to fix this kind of stuff. Our businesses are complicated enough. Everybody's hair is on fire. We all know that. There is a way to put it out. There is a way to calm down. It just takes process. You know, sometimes what happens is that people create their own little kingdoms within your business, right? They, they create that, like, look at all the things that I do that create value, right? Uh, I, I took on the gas cards. I took on the, you know, insurance uh, renewals. I took on the uh, whatever. And like most people are like, oh, well, who's going to do all that stuff? It's like, I think it'll get figured out. You know, like here's where that falls in the org, uh, organizational chart. Here's who that falls under. Like, you know, somebody may have to modify something. And uh, But at the end of the day, you got like seven people that are justifying their existence by doing, you know, busy work chores. And why that's it's that? unproductive. I've, I've noticed general. that a lot. Is that why why did we um create these kingdoms this is this is interesting to me and something you know we've talked a lot about um over the years and why do they create these kingdoms for themselves is it job security it's like if i'm the only one who knows how to do this then i always i think it is i i think it's just a, a, a an odd way of showing somebody value or you know doing more tasks it's like is it an essential core function of the business? Is it is it providing a higher level of service that's got a certain value to it? Is it creating more revenue? Is it uh, you know enhancing labor? Is it uh, reducing costs and driving more profit? It's not doing any of those things. You're just doing it to to do it. I, I had one. I walked into a business. I was the CFO of this business, and uh, it had it was chaotic. It was losing money, so I came in. And uh, there were like seven or eight people in the accounting department, uh, in the accounting department of this $20 million business, right? And and so you had your AR, your AP, you had uh, somebody doing job costs, you had somebody who was doing payroll, you had somebody, do, I mean, for every single accounting function, you had one person doing the accounting function. That's typically not how it works, right? 
accounting person will do multiple accounting functions. So the AP person might be doing payroll, you know. So I did the same exercise. I went around and watched what everybody did. And, and, and the, the most unique one was the, the person that was doing the job costing. So I said, okay, I sat with this person. What are you doing? Okay, job costing here. And then and I put it in the customer's folder. Then I file it here. I said, okay, well, what does somebody do with it after that? She's like, I don't really know. I said, so you don't know what the purpose of what you're doing is? She said, not really. So I went around and nobody knew. And, and I said, when was the last time somebody opened this besides you? Well, no one opens it besides me, this cabinet. And I said, okay, so maybe payroll references it somehow. No, no. And I said, well, how does it make you feel that what you spend 100% of your time doing, no one does anything with? Well, no one's ever put it to me that way before. It's like, oh, you know, <laughs> so, you know, that accounting department, uh, just I brought in a couple of my own people and that accounting department went to three people, you yeah. know, <laughs> and everything was more efficient, got done quicker and everybody was happier. Yeah, and and yeah. it's just that's just what happens. People create, you know, there's there's more stuff to do and the business is growing and it's just like we need this now and we need this now let's go hire people and, and it's you end up if you're not careful with just a, a crazy level of overhead that's just completely unnecessary very unnecessary i mean i've been in lots of business businesses myself and you know we have all these people working on yesterday's report spreadsheets and all this stuff and you have four or five different people working on it from four or five different parts of the business maybe it's accounting maybe it's uh, the office manager maybe it's the uh, department managers and they're all working on these reports and then when you take and you take you take a look at these reports and you start looking at them they're virtually all working on the same exact report it just in different order <laughs> And I've seen this so many times and I'm like, can we just get rid of the five and keep the one and who wants to do it? <laughs> the one person, because they're all working. It, I just never see anything like, well, I can't say I've never seen anything like it. I see it over and over again. I just can't believe that I see this over and over again. And it's the same reports. There is no new new information coming from any of those reports. It's on, on another report. And we spend all this time on it. It's It goes back to as simple as this. Here's an easy junk drawer for you to stop putting junk into is um, chasing inventory. Um, you know, we get a lot of requests. You know, oh, I have inventory. I'll do inventory. I say, you know what, well, we, we can manage parts and supplies, but full blown inventory is not for our trades. This, it doesn't work in our trades. That's for a distributor. Uh, you know, a, a Amazon needs to have inventory. We're, we're selling services. It's different. So it's a different type of inventory. And they're like, I need inventory. And why? Well, because I think we spend too much money and we're not knowing where all the parts are going. And I said, well, great. What's the average amount of money spent on parts and supplies, not including equipment? Well, you don't really need to inventory equipment because you have it co-signed, consigned, and someone's counting it, and it's handled. You know, or you go buy what you just sold. It's real simple. That's easy. But when it comes to parts, capacitors, things like that, supplies, rags, razor blades, whatever it is that they need, zip ties, things like that, how much do you spend on that stuff a year? And the average amount of money spent on that kind of stuff, which we're trying to inventory in our minds, I don't know, 5%, 3%, not a very big number, very, very small number. But here's where it gets funny. And I'll give an example of a company, the exact numbers, um, $12 million-ish business, um, sitting around the table. We got all the managers there, counting all the, all the management staff there. And inventory came up and I said, okay, since all these people are here, you obviously know how much you spend on parts and supplies. And they go, yeah, I know that one. And so the guy pulls up a spreadsheet and looks at it and he goes, $700,000 on $12 million worth of stuff last year. I said, all right, that's a pretty big number, right? And they go, yeah. All right, put your hands up. If you are contributing at any point in controlling inventory. And there was about eight of us in the meeting. Six of the eight put their hands up. 
Of course, the owner did because he's got all these people. He's got six people doing it, right? So the owner didn't put his hand on it. So all these six people were managing inventory. So, so who were those people? It was the department manager for HVAC, a plumbing manager, a um, the accounting department, you know, a couple of people in the county, um, the payroll person, you know, so the, because they deduct parts and all this stuff from the payroll, they made it very complicated. So they had all these people doing it. And I go, and what are we trying to accomplish here with all these people with their hands in the pot? Well, we just feel like that we're, we are losing, we're so, it's a big business. We don't know what's going out the door. You know, if the guys are selling it on the side or doing any of these things. And I said, okay, how much do you think that is? And they go, well, I can tell you how much it is. We, we, when we do account, um, we're usually off from anywhere from five to 7%. And I go, okay, um, well, I don't really know math all that well. So I'm going to use 10% because I can do 10% math. It's real simple for me. It's what I told them. Of course, I can do 5%, 7% math. It doesn't matter. But I made the number bigger on purpose. I said, all right, so we're talking about $70,000 of stuff disappearing is what it, in a worst case scenario in there, right? Yeah, yeah. It's never been that high, but yeah. Okay. I said, all right, well, let's just use 70,000. Um, raise your hands up if you make more than $70,000. Every hand went up. And I'm like, and okay, now what? And that's all I said. Now what? And I'm like, sorry, we get it. And I'm like, there's a problem. That That's the problem is we're, we're so busy chasing something that costs us more money to chase it. You get it. You, you have nickels chasing pennies. Yeah. And, and, and not revenue generating, not, you know, operation, but just didn't know. even factor that part in. Right. Yeah. That's just straight up one thing and all the revenue generating. And then it's funny you bring that up because that was the next part of the lesson that I was trying to teach him was what if we took that 5% and applied it to increased revenue or 5% and increased uh, close rate or, or any number of things that actually generate revenue, wouldn't that be more productive? So you did 12 million, 5% more would be 600 K. You just wrote a check for your entire parts and supplies and got to keep the rest because you made a 5% difference on the other side, the side that mattered, the side that you were hired to do instead of, and then the funny thing was that I couldn't believe they said, well, that's the way he wants it. And they all point to the boss. <laughs> that's it. That's <laughs> it. And guess what? That's where, that's where the problem was. The boss. That's I'll tell you what, that's the, something that you just said there. So, why every business in our space has opportunity to grow, right? And this is how, how I view it. I, I kind of view every business that I've ever been into, even the most successful, largest ones, uh, as, as being semi-broken, right? There's always an opportunity to fix something and, and grow like way more than, than, than you might think annually. Here's why. It's the power of compounding, right? So let's just say... Every area of business, could you could you at least have like a two and a half percent increase in performance in every area of your business, like a kind of a basic baseline every year, two and a half percent? Okay, so so let's just start. Uh, could you increase call count two and a half percent? Could you increase uh, the call capture rate, your booking rate, two and a half percent? Yep. Could you increase the uh, amount of calls that uh, don't cancel, or decrease the amount of calls that cancel by two and a half percent? Could you increase the uh, turnover rate on those calls by two and a half percent? Could you increase the average uh, that you replacement rate on those two and a half percent and the average sale two and a half percent? If you follow the two and a half percent up, you just uh, and every one of those categories, it leads to a you got to lead to a 30 percent improvement in business. If you can just execute in those things, two and a half percent all the way across the board. Oh, right. Okay. So you can always do that. If, if you were executing at a high level and you just had two and a half percent increase in all of those things across the board every year in every business, there'd be endless growth, regardless of what the economic environment is. Exactly. And it's such a small amount. It's just focusing, 
and getting rid of the junk drawer so you can focus. It's no different than a shiny object that you really didn't need that was going to solve your problem. It comes back down always to the numbers, the fundamentals, and the data. And if you have those three and you understand those three, everything can be resolved. Everything can be fixed. And you don't have to go beyond that. And I, and, and I love the two and a half percent rule. But the thing about it is you don't have to work on all of them. You just pick one, figure it out, then go to the next one. And you don't have to fix them all this year. Just fix as many as you can without screwing up something else. Let's talk about that for a second. We have a tendency to solve problems by fixing a problem while creating three more. Yeah. So. Yeah. Don't, 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 uh, you know, improve all those categories two and a half percent and then go hire 28 other uh, office based employees to yeah. not because you know you're a bigger company with bigger revenue. Yeah. <laughs> and and so, it's what I see so often is okay. We're, we are solving for this, but we created this much more, which was worse than the original problem in the first place. And that's easily that biggest part that I see that in is, you know, just paying people, you know, paying the techs out in the field and adding, you know, well, we're not selling enough stuff, right? Well, let's add a spiff to get them to spell more, sell more, you know? Well, you think you solved a problem, but as you realize the ones that are getting the spiffs are the ones that would have gotten them before you added, they were earning the spiff before you even offered the spiff because they were doing it. The other people do it for a day or two and then they're not doing it anymore. And so it's the same net result, but just cost you way much more money and labor costs. <laughs> there is no gain because it, it just basically is the same. So I can't be the only one that tells all of my uh, horror stories of all of it because it's kind of endless. To be honest there, it's kind of endless. Uh, there's got to be something that you had like, what was your biggest junk drawer that you found in your business? Well, my biggest one um, was actually a complicated pay system. I mean, that was the one that, you know, caused us the most problems uh, because we tried to f solve problems by incentivizing someone to do something they should already be doing. And to me, that is the easiest one that people get wrong and the one that causes even more problems because I found out that the simpler you make your pay system and the easier it is to understand, and then you can back it up and support those guys and girls to do the best that they can possibly do because you're available to help them do better. Yeah. You don't need the spiffs and you don't need the bonuses because they will make way more money anyway because they need the support. And they can't, they can't call in when they can't figure something out and get somebody that's mad because that person's mad because they just got off their 10th stupid email or 10th meeting of the day already that didn't even matter. And then by the time a tech needs them for help, they're all disgruntled, you know, and their job is to help the tech get better, right? And it all comes back to, you know, the many things like that, that, you know, I saw was, was that and then alone is it started with the pay system and then I just kept going. I just kept going. How do I make this easier? How do I make this easier? How do I and and once we did that, I, I couldn't stop. And I still to this day, we we're we're having a whiteboard session on Thursday here at Billy Go. And the whiteboard session on Thursday at Billy Go is what are you now doing that you didn't do before that we need to get out of your junk drawer? I mean, that's why I want to talk about this this week is because we're literally doing that meeting. You know what I think I'll do? I'll record that meeting. I want to film that yeah. meeting. Yeah, I, you know, that's, you know, you're, that was a great example. I don't know if we're supposed to mention names, you're going to edit it out or not, but so uh, it reminded me that, you know, Cassie Pound, uh, she's in Oklahoma. She's got a great business there. She posted in, in the group, uh, she said, does anybody have a, an incentive a program, a SPIF program or whatever to uh, provide to the installers to reduce callbacks and, and warranty calls or something that, like that. I'm, I'm sure I'm not getting 100% correct, but she was looking for an incentive plan to help reduce the, the number of callbacks and, and warranties that the installers were uh, producing. And 
And I think several people answered and, and provided, uh, you know, what she was asking for. But I don't think uh, I think I answered. I don't remember exactly what I said. But the the point that you just made is, is essentially what I was was trying to tell her. It's like I I think you, congratulations on identifying it. At, at, an area of challenge in your business with the data, et cetera, and you know, quantify the challenge and then, you know, then formulate an action plan to rid yourself of that challenge and don't solve it by throwing money at it, spit at it, complicating your pay structure, you know, like just if you continue to, to do that. And this it comes from a good place. Most everybody does it. Everybody has a challenge and they throw an incentive or a spiff or something at it to resolve the challenge. But then, you know, before you know it, you got 17 different things going on that uh, excessively complicates it. And then you have a massive junk drawer. So uh, that was, that was a great example because I'm, I'm, that's something that I think almost everybody can relate to in this business. You know, that's a great question. And I'm glad, you know, that's one thing I love about Facebook. You know, you can ask questions and get some answers and, you know, a lot of them, a lot of people don't have the answers. A lot of us do and don't. And, I just go from experience and my experiences was that I was kind of complicating stuff when I was trying to uncomplicate. <laughs> well, yeah. that's complicated. Trying to uncomplicate stuff. So I'm just trying to help people understand that, you know, we have, I'm, I've said this before and I'll just say it every podcast if I need to, wherever you are in your journey in your business, it's already making enough money. Land and I are going to do everything we can to help you find a way to get it to the bottom line through these conversations that we're having, because this is what we talk about all the time. We want to figure out how do we get every dollar, every penny down to the bottom line because it really does matter. And you don't have to do another dollar in revenue to double your profit. That's what I don't think anybody really understands or is getting from when I talk about things, I'm talking about growing your business. I'm not talking about growing it from the top line. I'm talking about growing it from within. How do you get it so, uh, such a well-old machine that it's just producing money nonstop and get that stress out of your life? The mo number one cause of divorce in any family is money. It is number one. This is a study that says that. So money is number one. And as owners, small business owners, it's usually a husband and wife team. Even as we grow, it continues to be a husband and wife team. And they bring the work and the stress home. They don't bring the joy home after a while. They love their businesses. They love their employees. They love their customers. They love all these things, but they don't bring that love and joy home with them. They bring the stress of the business home with them. And if we can do anything at all is to alleviate that stress that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, the stress of your employees, the stress of your yourselves and help you to go and have a dinner and talk about something other than the business. If we can do that for just one couple, one business, I would feel like we succeeded Yeah, because that is really what it comes down to. We are a industry of family running the business and we can't continue to have all the stress brought home. And over the past five to seven years, you know, people have made more money in life on the outside. It's gotten better per se because of more money, but the stress never went away. The taking the bad stuff home with you has never gone away. It's still there. So money doesn't change that. It's got to be how we operate our businesses and how we move forward. And if we can help anyone just understand that and let's simplify these businesses and build efficient businesses so that when we go out to dinner, we're going out to dinner not to have a drink to forget, but to have a drink to have fun and enjoy. Celebrate. Yep. 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 Celebrate. And, and that's why, I, you know, we wanted to do this. And so with that. You've just entered deeper into the no BS zone with today's no BS moment. My no BS moment is wearing shoe covers into the house from the outside. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen so many texts, especially when these, uh, these uh, companies that are in our area, 
they do their marketing and they're shooting their commercials and the guy's wearing his shoe covers outside and he walks inside and brings everything in. It's worse than just wearing your shoes in. And so I call BS on that. Let's wait until we step inside the house to put on our shoe covers. All right, everyone. Hope everybody has an opportunity to go out and have a great dinner tonight. And um, thank you very much for listening. And what is it you always say at the end, Landon? Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. There you go. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening. Stay tuned. We'll have another one again next Tuesday. It's 12 Central. Thank you very much. Like and subscribe. Bye. No BS with Billy and Landon is produced and delivered to you by Sarah Systems. At Sarah Systems, we've created a better way to run your home service business and unlock unprecedented growth. Our field service software was designed by real home service professionals to help you save steps, charge for previously unbillable time, and win more business. But the true change requires more than software. Our live coaching helps you understand and control the aspects of your business that matter most. It's about time for a new era of service, and we are leading the way. If you're ready to join the hundreds of other contractors who've been able to increase profit margins more than 50% within six months, visit sarah.tech today. That's sarah, S-E-R-A, dot tech today.